saturated with water returned to blue goo. Um, this is what the sediments look like. This is landing of a transport uh, airplane, C-130, on the Argentine Air Force Base on Staten Island. Um, Argentines, of course, have this funny, uh, um, um, funny thing about calling uh, everything their own name, so the Carlos Maldives, right? Uh, this, in this case, they call this Alan Morano. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have, I guess it's a matter of their uh, pride. Uh, national pride. So uh, this is this is on a dry day, and as the um, there is no there is no uh, permanent airstrip. The airstrip is just a dirt strip, and when airplane lands, that's the cloud of, of dust that comes out of that. And uh, this is what uh, helicopter pilot really hate about working on sea morale because whenever they they get down, they have a cloud of dust and all that stuff goes in there whatever this air suction things, and then it just clogs the engine. And then they have this funny thing there, they have a skywalks there. This is the aluminum strips put on the on the rusty barrels there. And I first did not realize what's going on until until we had a big snowfall and everything melted down. So this is the base, this is the Morambia base, uh, Argentine Air Force base. This is the Waddell Sea. And this is a very calm, sunny day with a nice bergs on the horizon, and you can see this deep tracks in the in the mud. So what happens whenever you have a snowstorm and the snowstorms come from the South Pole, the South Pole is that away. Uh, 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 you have everything covered with and uh, I mean uh, you realize that these buildings have a steel reinforcement ribs on it. And this is for uh, uh, for real because if they wouldn't they wouldn't be just flat on the ground. They had this uh, satellite antenna with the reinforcement ribs, and we had one storm there, that's during the summer there in Antarctica, that this thing was essentially blown, and I've seen this riblets essentially twisted like that, uh, and that was wind. Uh, uh, during the winter, it gets worse because it gets permanently dark during the winter, it's like 24 hours dark. So it basically sits in base, and I don't know what to do. If, you, if you're really like outgoing person and you like to go out, you, you'll just basically transferred to a psychiatric facility or something like that because, I mean, people cannot take that. You step out of the base if you do two meters and you will never find the base again because it's just a blizzard and you can't see anything, you just get disoriented. But the fact of the matter is that this one, um, one time we had everything covered with snow and sometimes this building are completely covered with snow with the snow drifts. So they, you can't even open the door because all snow drifts all over the, all over the roof. Um, so, and then this uh, snow melted, and then all of that turned into a uh, liquid mud. And this is the tracks of the truck, and if the truck gets stuck there, they don't even bother to dig it out. They just leave it there in the mud, and things sinks all the way to the, like all the wheels completely sinks and it sits there on the belly. And then when it dries out, they come there with like uh, sledgehammers and the picks and just, just dig it out. That's, uh, but, but there's, there's, there's really no other way to deal with that. So this is one of the lovely snowstorms uh, in the in the summertime uh, in Antarctica, and uh, you get that situation, uh, and uh, uh, you get all this uh, all this snow you know, blown around. So don't, don't don't even complain to me about the junior field camp. I, 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 I do not I do not want to hear. And you know what that tent is? It's a toilet tent. And near the toilet tent, you have a shovel because the sometimes toilet tents completely covered with snow, so you have to dig your way in with a shovel and dig your way out with a shovel is a little more <laughs> Because the whole thing was snow drift. It becomes a snow drift. Uh, so yeah, when people when people complain about bad weather in the in the junior field camp, I really I really not very compassionate about that. Uh, well it gets cold uh, because this is my tent. Um, uh, there with another guy, and this is a snow drift that formed in 15 minutes during the snowstorm. And this is the time of the snowstorm where I can actually get out. And the reason why we have this crates there is because this tents, the Eureka tents that we have, these are cranky tents, that uh, actually they're, they're good quality tents, but they cannot stand in dark wind. They're, they're essentially start to start to rip apart. We have one tent that went flat on the ground, and there was like a like a poles would start breaking, like like snapping, and we have like a broken poles. So we had all this all these crates with like food and and uh, and booze that Argentines gave us, and uh, we just put these crates around because we had that that tent start ripping, and while it was still warm, we put some duct tape on it, but then it became so cold that you take a duct tape 
on the edge and that thing broke down because it was frozen. <laughs> and then, and then, in order to take that tent out, I had to use an ice axe because the tent was completely frozen in ice. Because when you sleep on it, uh, you actually your body generates enough heat to melt the water, and then the water freezes, and the whole tent slowly sinks into the frozen frozen ice. It actually works well for you because it's they kind of form a little protective barrier, but then we try to take the tent out, it's kind of frozen to the uh, to the whole thing. So uh, you know that's so you know and uh, when you talk about oh my god with the bad weather. And the How long were you out there? Huh? How long were you out oh, there? Several times, like a couple of months or something like that. Jesus. Yeah. Oh, and you and your, your nearest shower is in the base, which is uh, twelve miles away, and uh, you do not have any vehicles or roads there. If you wish to, you can walk there. Uh, and the water that they do there coming from the filters, and it has a lot of mud in it. So when you wash your hair there, uh, you might as well shake out the silt out of your hair afterwards. So, um, uh, you know, when you live there for two or three months, you use baby wipes. Uh, you know, so it's, 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 it's a lot of fun to do field work there. <laughs> and when, when there's a snowstorm, and this is, this is the mild one, you can see the snow flowing by, you kind of, we had a big tent, we had a big Canadian tent, like a truck door in the oven that work on any kind of fuel, and they just brought us like two huge barrels of radiation fuels of kerosene. So burning that, and you, you can't, can't go to work, so you just, you just sit there and, and uh, you know, I don't know, eat and drink and, you know, invent some kind of things to do. Like we did the, uh, we decided that uh, uh, one day that we want to figure out who remembers the most number of base in Antarctica, so we took a huge pan, and we took a huge cake, a pancake in the shape of Antarctica, yeah, then we took MMFs, opened a pack of MMFs, and started throwing them on the pan, on the on the pancake and the naming the bases. You know, oh, that's McNary. Okay, this is Palmer. This is the oh, this is Paul Brown. Yeah. Yeah. So we figured out that we remember every, every one of us have a particular color of MMFs. Oh um, yeah. Good. All right. So see, even even the projector can't take that. Uh, what were you doing out there? Huh? What were you doing out looking there? Looking for looking for fossils. What we were doing was studying KT boundary in Antarctica. Oh. And um, and uh, oh, then we were looking first. We we're looking for mammals for the fossil for marsupials, and then we we're looking for KT boundary. And then at some point, that storm stops, and all that snow melts and soaks into ground and turns everything into that. <laughs> And this is actually the tents that are proper for Antarctica. And you notice that tent that has that has tons of uh, crates around it. And this is uh, called a Scott tent. Uh, it's called a Scott tent because if you ever heard about Robert Falcon Scott, uh, this is the guy who froze to death in one of the one of these. Uh, but uh, uh, he didn't froze to death because the tent was dead. Actually, when they found their bodies, the tent was still standing. The tent has a aluminum reinforced poles about that big and it's a pyramid and it had triple layers of material and you crawl inside through the sleep and then you wake in the Scott stand in the brightest sunny day it's pitch dark inside because the tent is so thick that it you know the wind actually wouldn't go through so uh, we had uh, one guy there with, uh, stayed with um, another fellow uh, at that time my advisor and, and another guy stayed his, in this tent and one morning we just we just lost it because what happened is that <clears throat> my advisor stand actually the ones that went flat down the ground so we're laughing hysterically and he was like really pissed off <laughs> so he got on the radio and told Argentines to bring them bring him a Scott tent so there's a, um, at some point when it calmed down the Argentine helicopter showed up they dropped him a tent so they put the tent in they got the tent and next morning we heard the scream oh my god I'm blind what's going on <laughs> so like, shut up I'm you a Scott tent <laughs> so that's what that that's how dark the Scott tent is. Uh, same thing going on uh, in the Arctic. Uh, so if you think that Arctic is any better, no. This is Ellesmere Island in Arctic Canada, and uh, this is the trail of mud from uh, from um, uh, the uh, living tent into the radio tent. You see antenna and stuff like that. Um, uh, Canadians uh, Canadians are way more uh, uh, careful about everything, so you have to go. Uh, on the radio, 6 p.m. every day. If you don't, they will just send somebody to rescue you, even if you're just, you know, doing something else there. Uh, so this is <laughs> this is what happened. If you have like a, um, we had that uh, 
uh, this unusual year there that actually had rains there in, uh, in, uh, in Arctic Canada. And uh, this is everything turns. This is what mud means to you know to the on the surface. Now, as far as more of a geology stuff, uh, this is uh, Durango, Colorado. That's where we do our senior field camp. And what you're looking at, you're looking at a big glacial valley here. And the valley is being carved by a glacier. Uh, and uh, the valley is, glaciers are not stupid. They uh, move in the path of the least resistance. So the path of the least resistance is that dark gray shale, which is a Cretaceous mangus shale. So the whole valley essentially is scraped, you know, carved within that shale. So because the shale is softest unit, all right? And whatever you see that slope like that, that's pretty much mangoes shale. And you have a, a Cretaceous Mesoberry sandstones on top of that. And then uh, way, way over there, have a one mountain. Um, this is what the parts of that look like. This is actually mangoes shale. This is the portion of the mud rock with uh, coal that belong to Cretaceous Manatee group, um, but this is the this is the Mangus slopes in the uh, in the Durango Valley. Um, this is a contact between a, a black shale and the sandstone. You have some oxidation over the hard ground contact here, erosional surface, a regular surface here, as expected, and uh, you can see that the shale actually is not exactly fissile, it's more like a flaggy shale and it breaks into irregular pieces. This is uh, more of a slabby shale that you have not really the facility, but you have a uh, pieces that breaks on two, they have a two parallel surfaces and they're fairly thick, so they are not really a papery thin facility, they're more like a slabs of rock. Now this shale is on Elsner Island in Arctic Canada, and uh, this one is was deposited uh, in a lake, uh, in a large lake that existed there about uh, 47 to 50 million years ago. And this has a pretty healthy mix of silt in it, so it's kind of a kind of a silty shale. But you can see that the slabs laying around here are fairly thick, uh, and this is more of a uh, this is more of a classic shale in a sense of a flaggy shale. That this is the black shale, uh, this is the Balkan Mountains in Bulgaria. And uh, what you're looking at, you're looking at this uh, pieces of shale that break as irregular pieces. Sometimes they have parallel surfaces, sometimes they do not. It's about the one flat surface, and the rest of them are kind of as triangular, something like that. And it breaks into this. Uh, into this multitude of, uh, of uh, pieces. Some of them are fairly thin, needle-like pieces. That's a typical sort of a flaggy shale that, uh, that you get in the end. So that's, that's kind of a, that's how I kind of encounter shales in the field. Um, this is the uh, upper part of the Mancos shale. And uh, that, particular, that particular slide shows you a couple of things. Well, first of all, you got sort of the wavy bedding here, okay? That's that's what it is. Second of all, on uh, what you see here, and you see that with other types of shale, you see a gradual transition from the shale into a sandstone. So, so this is near the top of that transition where uh, you have uh, more sandstone appearing. So you do have ripple marks forming in the shale. Uh, another thing you have to consider is the compaction rate of shale versus the compaction uh, uh, compaction value of sandstone. If you have about that much of sand, when you compact it, you get about that much of sandstone. If you have that much of shale, when you compact it, you get uh, that much of mud. When you compact it, you get that much of shale. So if you actually take that picture and unravel it back, you will realize that this is about how much sandstone you have here, but this is about how much shale you're going to have. So mud, sorry. So original mud that formed the shale, because shales are very prone to dewatering, and because of the clays, because swelling up, all that compaction takes a lot of water out of mud and turn them into the shales. Another point here is very interesting. You can see those little round things here. 
These are boroughs, right? Then when this was unconsolidated, and uh, when it was in mud, that's where organisms wanted to go because that's where they find their food particles, and that's where they were crawling around, okay? And then this lighter material is a sandstone from the top that filled the burrows from the top. And they actually crawl in the mud, they always do. Crawling in the sand is pointless and maybe pretty because of the quartz grains, but there's no food. They're looking for food and all food is there. So those are pretty close to their original size though. What, the sands? Yeah, the, 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 the burrows. burrows. Yeah. yeah, the burrows pretty close to the original size. They probably squished a little bit, but because they're filled with sand, you can kind of see that the mud goes kind of around. Yeah. Uh, this is the chunk of uh, shale that has been incorporated in the sandstone of Hermosa formation and deformed. So it's kind of a large rip up clast, and this is the clast of mud rock that was incorporated in sandstone on a semi consolidated piece of shale, underlining shale. So that tells you that shales are fairly soft, and uh, there was a layer of shale right here. And as you have a sandstone with a more uh, active uh, environment with a more uh, more kind of higher energy conditions. That's that's what happens with it. It's kind of get reworked. Um, this is uh, um, a turbidite deposit at Pigeon Point in California. And besides all the convolute structures and the um, um, the um, the drag marks and everything. This is a uh, sort of a turbidic current deposit. So you have a lot of convolute structures and uh, load casts, uh, and uh, you have more convolute structures. So this is more of a turbidic current that deposited. It was uh, really sort of a, uh, if you wish, a very sediment-saturated current. So it wasn't the current that moved down with the speed of a train real fast, but rather uh, think about kind of toothpaste flowing down the down the sink sort of situation. Uh, if you squeeze the toothpaste too, and then it, so that would be that would be it. And then uh, a little bit of sorting on more of a liquid layers would deposit all this all this mud stone on top of that. And then the coarser material would be uh, would be a sand, a coarse sand. So you have kind of a uh, cycles of the turbidity of the individual turbidity currents. And then you have convolute structures in there. Uh, this is the same outcrop that I showed you before on Osmer Island in Canada. And uh, this is little Japanese pencil, it's about that big. So you can kind of evaluate the, uh, uh, the um, size of that outcrop. And this is actually, if you look at, um, if you uh, look at your page 10, uh, the bottom picture, this is exactly what the, uh, what the bottom picture represent that. You have a lenticular bedding in it, okay? So this is what, what you see as a lenticular bedding. Uh, and all it is, this lenticular bedding and little lenses are buried ripples. The buried ripples that were buried with mud, washed over, and this is the remnants of this little little ripples that made out of very fine sand. So this is more of a fissile shale in a classic sense. This is a new Albany shale in southern Indiana, which is Devonian. The analog for the Chattanooga shale, if you remember 2100, uh, I talked specifically about the black shales in the Devonian, in the Devonian anticontinental sea. Yes, no, maybe, no, Glenn? Okay, uh, about the di differential depth in the anticontinental sea, how they have a restricted basins within the anticontinental sea, large restricted basins. Remember that? Yeah, you can continue? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. sure. Uh, and the deposition of the of the black shales. Now, this is really sort of a papery thin uh, uh, shale that you literally pick up the layers of it as thin as paper. And uh, this uh, precipitated in the restricted basin with a lot of organic matter, anoxic conditions and organic matter actually dispersed, so you have the edge to edge uh, sort of a uh, Clay particles connection. Uh, You're going backwards. Yes, I noticed that. All right. Uh, this is a kind of a situation in between, where you have in between the slabby and fissile shale. And in some cases like that, 
you have to make a call. Either you call it a slabby shale or you call it a fissile shale. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you, but when you do either way, it would help to record how thick it is. Or it can be, or you can use one of the textual classification and tell it's paper thin or thick or medium or something like that. But you do see the horizontal bedding here, although it's broken in some places because of slumps and stuff like that. And you see this little platelets that are going on, although some layers are fairly, fairly thick. Uh, this is the fissile shales uh, that are, so there's a whole bunch of the pictures that I took in Balkan Mountains in Bulgaria. This is the uh, Silurian shales. And uh, uh, this is interesting thing about them. I'll show you a few successive pictures where uh, this shales has been very intensely deformed several times. The latest deformation was uh, during the Cenozoic time when uh, uh, Eurasian plate collided with the African plate that led to the uh, uh, Alpine orogeny and the of the Alps. And the Balkan Mountains were part of that process. So you would have actually, you have to look at the shales from a prospect of, of bedding, okay, that the shales are uh, turned vertically. Uh, and this shale is a very dark, uh, just, just a sunny day. You do have a reddish uh, uh, brown color on the fissile surface of the facility because the shale split that way and that's where the water gets. But this is purely superficial. This is not extending inside the shale. You can literally take a tip of a rock hammer or a pocket knife and scratch it and underneath there will be fresh shale. Um, this is some more of the shale, that's what, they, that's what they look like. And this is, you can clearly see the, the facility in this shales. Uh, this is what the pieces look like, they're fairly thin. And in fact, this uh, shales were accumulated in, um, in a deep restricted basin, like a trough, uh, oceanic basins, in basin. And what you find there, because it's Silurian, you find a plenty of graptolites. Uh, everybody remember the graptolites? No. No. Okay. Uh, you know what the Portuguese man of war is, right? Yeah. Well, graptolites were sort of kind of Portuguese man of war in the Silurian. That they had this little, there's a colonial animals that has like a feather like uh, uh, tentacles that, that did not consist of, it's not individual animals, it's a colony of the cells that sits there. And uh, uh, they are very diagnostic because they were planktonic and they would swim. Through the entire water column, and they were distributed all over uh, throughout the oceans. And uh, you know, uh, uh, late Ordovician and Silurian, that was particularly uh, at the time for the graptolites. And there's actually some geography, some geography for this time period to develop entirely the graptolites. Uh, some more of that. And you can start seeing that you have a tectonic fractures through that, uh, through that uh, uh, shale. Now, here is the deal that what you're looking at right here, you're looking at the tectonic fractures. And the tectonic fractures can get, this is, uh, this is a fairly good spacing between the joints, between the tectonic joints. But actually the bedding of the shales goes like this. And then uh, if those tectonic joints become uh, three or four times more dense, then you're standing in front of that shale and you're thinking, where is the bedding and where are the tectonics? It becomes vital because if you, uh, I don't know if you uh, uh, if you uh, went over that in structural geology, in structural geology, or in the field methods, but if you have an axial cleavage in the rocks, and this is sort of a sort of a cleavage joints, if you have an axial cleavage, you can actually tell by the bedding versus cleavage whether the rocks are overturned or they're in normal uh, um, uh, in normal sequence. Um, and with the shales, you do not have, uh, with the deep water shales like that, you don't have column tracks, you do not have load cut casts, you do not have drag marks. So you don't have any other usual indicators that you can use in the shallow marine rocks. So this is, this is the way it goes, that you actually have all this, uh, all this uh, rocks coming like that, 
right? And uh, this is tectonic cleavage, and then uh, you really, when you're standing next to the artwork, you cannot tell it, but when you step back, you can actually see the banding of the rocks. And this banding is only here, not because of the dramatic change of the color of the, the various oxidation levels. And uh, some of this, as you can see, are populated by lichens. And the lichens give the organic matter. And the organic matter dissolves part of the shale and gives it this whitish, bleachy color in some of the layers. So this is not a natural banding. If you start digging into that, you will find out that the rocks are exactly the same color as here. It's just the amount of retained water. So sometimes this is a purely superficial feature on the rock. It's not, it's not something that is an inherent property of the rock. So this is the classic example of where is bedding and where is the cleavage. So in this particular case, the cleavage actually goes that way and the bedding goes that way. Um, this is a layer of bentonite right here, the green bentonite. Those of you who have been to the junior field camp have seen the bentonite layer uh, in Tennessee, fairly thin one, or it will cover the snow. And that was Moore's Gap. That was Moore's Gap. Moore's Gap. Yeah. 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 Oh, I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, you know. So you had a mildly, like a mildly kind of. But anyway, this is a large bentonite layer, very thick bentonite layer. This is Norway. Uh, this is uh, Ehrenstadt formation. Uh, and uh, this is um, uh, Ordovician. This is Caradelf Ordovician. So a large eruptions in the Ordovician would produce this thick bentonite layers. And uh, right below that, you would have uh, a base of the Ehrenstadt formation with the straight noculoids, which are about that size. This, this, and most of the collect dissolved, and I was looking, what is that? And then, and then the guy, I heard two guys, and they're speaking Norwegian, and then I heard the name, because you, you have some common things between Norwegian and English, and I said, oh, because these things were actually, it's not like, you know, it's, it was basically a hole. I said, who the hell drew the hole? I realized this is like a straight orthophone nodeloid that's huge uh, in the, uh, the Ernstein formation. But this is this is the bentonite layer. And with all these rocks, I mean, they're very hard, so you have to use a hammer on this. But this one you can dig with your finger. So this is essentially volcanic ash, turned into, into mud in the clay. Um, as far as the low grade construction goes uh, for, the, for the clays and shales, this medieval towers in the Caucasus Mountains. Heard about modern Chechnya? That's exactly where that is. Uh, I was working there when I was undergraduate student. It was dangerous back then, although there was no war, open war. But that's, but that's what they have. See this, uh, this uh, roofs here that are kind of layered. All of this are made from Jurassic black shales. Jurassic black shales come right here from upper slope. And in fact, it was harder for these people to gather stones for these buildings uh, than to um, uh, than to actually find these shales. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, the settlements are from like the 15th and 16th century, and they just stand there in the mountains like that. And uh, there are a couple of funny things about them. One of them that you would think that there is a stairwell in the tower. No, it's not. There is, there is a little room up there with this little kind of uh, uh, windows, and inside uh, it's either solid or a hollow to a certain point. Okay, so what they did, they used the wooden ladders, they climbed the wooden ladder, they pulled the wooden ladder up, and then they sit there with bows and arrows and shoot their enemies. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this is the way that, I guess, uh, the brutal defense were there. So it's a little fortress instead of a mountain fortress there. And then they have the buildings like that, the little crawling thing, and that's what makes these places really dangerous, because if locals will actually see you near that place, uh, they can actually shoot you without warning, and the reason being is that they're the sacred places there for their ancestors. And the way they uh, lived there, at least in at least in the 1980s, is I think they're still doing it today. Uh, is that um, inside this this little things? And I personally was risking my life looking into two of these. Uh, that uh, they're the dead people there basically. Uh, because the old people, when they feel that there is their time to die, 
they'll go up the mountains, they crawl into that thing and lay on the bones of their ancestors, and then they die. Uh, and then what happens is that nobody buries them, nobody takes them out of there. So uh, they sit there in the mountains and the air is really dry and clean. So they essentially like shrivel and, and kind of, so you look in there and you see this, this all the skull with the bulb with all this, all this skin in there and the ripped clothes and stuff like that. And they're just laying on top of each other literally. And if one of the locals will see you there and they have firearm, well, kind of from one of the old there. Uh, that's uh, besides the point that the people that live there are Muslims. <clears throat> Um, and they have their own, but, 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 but this is, see this is little towers and these things are scattered in the valleys there. And some of them do have this kind of ancestral burial thing and some of them do not. This particular one did not. So the ones that do not have any of that, they don't mind you coming there and uh, looking at whatever, but uh, the ones that do, they kind of iffy about that. Um, uh, so you can see the black shales here and the roofs were made out of a Jurassic black shales. So this is, so this is kind of a use of shales for the low grade construction. A uh, few other things about shales. Shales are really help to visualize things in a geologic sense. In this particular case, you see a person here for scale. I do show this slide at 2100. And this is the fault right here, all right? This is the fault. So uh, now you have to tell me which fault is that, normal or reverse. Mm -hmm. Where the foot wall, where the hanging wall? Mm -hmm. The foot wall, and there's a hanging wall, and the hanging wall coming up, right? So that's the first wall. If the, if the hanging wall goes down, that'll be normal wall, right? Right, okay. And the reason why we can see that so well is that most of that are actually shale and siltstones. And in one layer of sandstone, the same layer of sandstone here and here. Okay, so we got we got that visualized a little well. Another thing, see the anticline. This is uh, these are the layers of little nodules, the calcareous nodules, uh, that actually form along the former layer of bentonite, and all of that is just dark gray, really dark gray shale. Full of volcanic climate, not for these layers, this outcrop would look really massive, but all of a sudden, if we have the admix or we have any kind of different layer, they'll show us the geologic structure very well in that in that particular so you have the canyon and everything uh, within that within that sequence. All right, you can turn lights on.